Hi, it's Dave T here, and for those of you that have been following my off-grid mini-series, I've spent the past eight or nine months researching various aspects of producing electrical power whilst camping off-grid. The original intention for this research was so that I could create these videos, which will be a useful resource for other off-grid campers. But, perhaps inevitably, all of that research got me thinking about upgrading my own setup, and in this video I'll cover the various steps I took to double our caravan's existing 100 watt solar supply, as well as making the change to lithium batteries. I elected to add a new panel to the roof of our van, but I'm also planning to help a friend make a similar change, but for his van it will be with an additional ground mounted panel. As and when I complete that project, I shall make another video and link it here. Or of course you could subscribe and click on the bell to be notified of when I post at that and other videos. One of the first changes I made to the van was to swap out the previously upgraded solar charge controller from the EPEVA VS1024 controller to a Victron smart controller. Now this was not entirely necessary, but I wanted to gather data about the amount of solar power we generated. Also, because we were swapping to lithium, I wanted to have an easier and more precise control over the charging profiles, and I'll have a dedicated video about that soon. The Victron model I chose was the Victron Smart Solar MPPT 75 50, which allows status and history to be accessed via an app on a phone or a tablet. Replacing the controller is very easy to do, but you should take great care ensuring that you connect the cables correctly, especially if coming from another controller where the terminals may be in a different order. The maximum solar current that this controller can handle is borderline for running the panels in parallel. But higher current controllers are quite a bit more expensive and I had other reasons for wiring in series, so I opted to have save a few pounds with the 7515. Now for obvious reasons I didn't want to drill holes in the roof of the van, but because I already have a factory fitted panel there is an existing cable running through the roof. This was another reason to run the new solar panels in series, since that ensured that the existing cable was well within tolerance for the additional panels, since only the voltage would be increasing. It is also worth noting that the existing cable is not that long, and since the required cable size is determined by the combination of both current and cable length, it was within spec for either configuration, but I went for the safest. I also decided to replace the cable from the controller to the battery with a new 4mm cable running straight to the battery. The planned configuration could theoretically generate close to 15 amps of charge current, and the existing manufacturer's wiring is not only not very substantial, but also has lots of unnecessary joints in it. For example, when I removed the cupboard panel to gain access, I realised that the wires that actually connect to the controller output are just 8 inches long before they join the main wiring loom using a Molex type connector. This is a completely unnecessary joint that adds a risk of failure not to mention current loss. The new 4mm cable was run down through the adjacent wardrobe, under the bed, out through the existing, an existing cable gland in the floor, and then into the underfloor battery box. The cable is connected direct to the battery, but as a side note, after this video was shot I did actually add a fuse to protect the cable just in case the cable gets damaged. After using the off-grid power usage calculator that I created for the video which I've linked above, I've decided that for us 200 watts of solar panels would be more than sufficient. This meant adding an additional 100 watt panel to the roof, which is done by bonding the new panel on using a suitable sealant. We use Sudaflex 40FC along with these plastic mounts. It's a fairly simple process as long as you make sure that you key the surface with sandpaper and clean them thoroughly to remove grease and ensure that you have a good bed of sealant at least a couple of millimetres thick. The existing panel was connected using MC3 connectors which at the time of my installation were actually quite difficult to get hold of. I replaced one pair of the connectors with a new MC4 connector and then looped in the new panel with pre-made MC4 extension leads. This meant that only two new connections were actually required to be crimped. After all the research that I had made into batteries, staying with our standard wet lead acid battery did not really make sense with the extra solar we were adding. This is because the new solar panels can potentially generate around 10 amps or more of charge current. Lead acid batteries do not like to be charged at high currents and so much of this would go to waste unless it was actively being consumed by us at the same time. 
Since the highest charge rates are likely to be achieved around midday when we are likely to be away from the van, this seemed unlikely to be the case. I purchased the KS60 LTB 60 amp hour battery from KS Energy. This was less expensive than a 100 amp hour version, but by allowing deeper cycles, actually provided more usable energy than our old 100 amp hour lead acid battery. The battery is much smaller than its lead acid predecessor and a lot lighter. This left room in the restricted underfloor battery compartment to locate the Victron Smart Shunt. Now with regards to the smart shunt, I'll freely admit that because of the KS battery has a Bluetooth capabilities built in to monitor its capacity and also monitor sub-zero charging, the smart shunt was somewhat of a luxury purchase. The main reason for adding it was for a longer term review where I intended to monitor historical power usage. To this end, I found some limitations that I'll cover in a dedicated video. However, if you do decide to use a lithium battery which, is, which does not have Bluetooth features, then something like the Smart Shunt is essential to monitor battery capacity. This is because with lithium batteries, the voltage does not really tell you much with regards to remaining capacity. The terminal bolts on the Victron Shunt are actually 8mm diameter and I was not keen on changing the ring connectors on all of the existing cables. So instead, I made a short buzz bar out of 4mm copper strip. This allowed me to use the existing 6mm connectors while still having a neat connection. I made a simple backplate which conveniently did not require fixing in place as I could just wedge it in the gap between the, the old battery tray and the compartment. So far we have had just eight nights away in late April and then late May. On both trips, the new upgrade has performed well with the maximum power output of the solar panels hitting a high point of over 180 watts on a number of occasions. There was a brief minor issue with the Victron shunt disagreeing with the KS battery with regards to remaining capacity, but this was resolved by synchronizing the shunt once the battery was fully charged. The weather was not the greatest on the first trip away with mainly overcast skies and some rain. However, the lowest the battery reached was about 70% overnight, and it was always back to 100% by around midday the following day. We had a number of days where the sky was very overcast, but then the sun suddenly came out for an hour or so. At those points, the solar was able to charge the battery at around 10 amps, which confirmed one of the reasons for changing to lithium. We've actually found that the solar panels are now producing more energy than we can use, at least during spring and early summer. To counter this, I try to ensure that I charge other devices such as laptops and camera batteries during the day using the excess power. Without somewhere to put the power, the solar panels actually produce very little or even no power even when the sun is blazing down. On our second trip away, I actually forgot to charge my backup all powers unit and found that it was completely empty. In just two days, the solar panels not only provided all of our power requirements and kept our leisure battery topped up, but they also fully recharged the 372 watt hours of the all powers unit. So there you have it, all of the changes required to add a new controller, additional solar panel, smart shunt and lithium battery to a van with an existing solar panel. We haven't seen the battery go below 65% capacity, and this was only ever overnight. This is well within the specification of the lithium iron phosphate, so it should in theory hit the upper expectation of lifespan. Also, so far this has justified the theory that we did not need to replace our existing 100 amp hour battery, lead acid battery, with a 100 amp hour lithium. The detailed information given by the Victron app to show capacity and both power input and output gives an awful lot of reassurance and confidence about power management that is well worth having. Also it makes changing profiles when storing lithium batteries very convenient and I'll have a video coming out soon demonstrating that. The one remaining issue I currently have is with having a convenient means to power my USB-C powered laptop whilst editing these videos. I've already ordered some 12 volt high wattage USB-C PD sockets and adapters and I'll be making another video fairly soon discussing those. In the meantime, I hope you found this video helpful or at least interesting and if you have then please hit that like button. If you're interested in seeing other videos that I make then please consider subscribing to my channel. But most of all, thanks for watching.